No, exactly. There's some things in life that make me want to check. Half price to get one on the set. Right? I mean, you kind of appreciate the deal. You're like, awesome. But on the end, you're like, okay, taking some risks. About yeah. like, yeah. I'm going to throw it on the dice. Yeah, yeah. roll the dice. It'd be tons of fun gas station sushi. Uh, <laughs> always. <Yeah. laughs> At gas station, <laughs> anything. So they figured out France, they stopped at the gas station. They were traveling from. Dijon to driving down to Switzerland and pull off to the gas station and get it. And it's like, oh, we're going to have some food. But it's like, like they have one bag of eggs, camembert cheese. It's like, oh my gosh. I mean, maybe you don't get the sushi there, but like, you can get the whole cheese and get it again really nicely. So, how how long are you about in London before? End of July, next July, oh, wow. 2024. So I'm here for quite a while. Nice. Uh, so, missing Washington? Am I missing it? Uh, no, I'm having a good time in London. I really <laughs> like London. Uh, I think it's uh, it's so it's great. I love being here. Uh, it's been so much fun. It's also uh, a bit warmer than Washington these days. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, Seattle just. Uh, guys? Seattle's like, it's exactly the same as I left it, right? It's been months, but it's like, um, nothing's like, I'm gonna come back a year later, and nothing will change really, except oh, there's one building got put up. It's like, oh, it's new. <laughs> so there we are. But no. um, hi, can I intervene for a second? Yes, yes I, and, I hope you can hear me. So, yeah, I'm just observing that the audio is still unfortunately not great in the room, despite oh, okay. the IT trying then to fix it. Yes. How about you mute that one? Yep. Yeah, let's try that um, and see because it's it's anyway hard to hear people that are uh, far away. How about this? How about this? How about this? How about this? Yeah. So yeah, just yeah. yeah. Silence so the. Is that one muted? One muted? One muted? I should oh. I should have the only active mic. Well, can, yeah, can you guys hear me now? Yes. So okay, so now um, your your voice uh, is is very loud and clear. Just for everybody else in the room, keep that in mind uh, that uh, the further away you are, the harder it will be for us to hear you. I might interject a couple of times just to ask to repeat the question so that sure. people and, and I can, understand. If someone here asks something, I can make sure we'll make sure to yeah. speak over to my microphone. Thank just, you. Yeah, that would be great. Everyone else in the room here, okay, use the laptop because I think if we play the sound of the thing and then have the mic and laptop, then it won't be working. So, oh, like everyone here. here. And hopefully you won't have to hear too much. I'll be so clear. <laughs> yeah. Everybody will be like, oh my gosh, there's no question. Because it oh so there's no question. Uh, Levon, can okay. You... So so sorry, say it again. It just cut off. Yes, but when Ed was talking, that was already difficult to hear. All right, I okay, say. Okay. So, so yeah. first part, I'll unmute mine. And then when it's right, when, when you're about to talk, I will okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Um Get my mute here. Right, Nathan, right. just wanted to ask, is it okay to record this session? It's being yes, recorded yes. right now. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's off. off. Sometimes. I don't All right. All right. All right. I think you need to mute. And I, okay, I we're good. Ask, we're good. I think we're good now. I will ask just one more <laughs> logistical question. Sorry, Are you... Are you okay with questions oh, during the talk, nice. or would you like questions? Plus, you have sound. Fast sound, yeah. Okay. Right. Are we are we good? Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's it was, go. Let's go for it. It's kind of like a a mind bomb. Right. Um. So before starting, I'd like to notify our audience online that today's seminar is being recorded. So obviously, if you'd like not to appear, kindly turn your cameras off. Uh. First of all, I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is our 35th seminar in the series, and today's seminar is a special seminar because it's coordinated together with the research engineering group here at the Allen Turing Institute. And it's also really cool that we have such a nice, um, fantastic turnout. So I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Zach Shwerep Conti, and I'm a Turing Research Fellow at the Allen Turing Institute here in London. And I would also like to introduce uh, the co my colleague and co-organizer of the seminar series, Andrea, who is far back there. 
Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Island Turing Institute, this is UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Uh, and if I can sneak in a side note, if any of you are interested in talking kindly, please uh, approach us. Um, yeah, so for, as for the format of the seminar, questions may be asked towards the end of the seminar and uh, either in person by using the raise hand function or directly in the Zoom chat. Without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today Professor Nathan Kutz, who is a professor within the Department of Applied Mathematics at the University of Washington in Seattle, and who is currently based at the Allen Turing Institute uh, for a period of time. His main research interests involve nonlinear waves and coherent structures, as well as dimensionality reduction and data analysis techniques for complex systems. Professor Kutz received his BS degree in physics and mathematics from the University of Washington, uh, his PhD degree uh, in applied mathematics from Northwestern University, and also has been faculty at the University of Washington uh, since 98, I believe. So, uh, and also was the author of several books, and lately has been elected as Fellow of Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics in 2022. So uh, lastly, I'd like to say, so Professor Kutz is also very well known for co-developing popular dynamic mode, the composition algorithm, which uh, David will very briefly introduce. Hi, um, I'll, I'll go through your through your audio. Zach. Of course. So um, yeah, I'm, my name is David. I'm part of the research engineering group uh, at the Alan Turing Institute. And before, before we start with Professor Kutz, I was just going to do a brief introduction, introduction to DMD. Um, so DMD uh, was first developed by Peter Schmidt in the field of um, fluid dynamics to identify spatial temporal coherent structures from high dimensional data, such as the flow field around the circular cylinder. Um, it is based on the proper orthogonal decomposition or principal component analysis and statistics and employs the SVD algorithm. And uh, the work of Nathan Kutz, uh, together with uh, colleagues Steve Brunton, Bingney Brunton, and Joshua Proctor, has been essential in the development of this uh, of the a generalization of DMD um, for the data-driven modeling and control of complex dynamical and multi-scale systems. So, without further ado, uh, let's start with our talk. Um, you have the floor, okay. Professor Kutz. Okay. Now, let's see, I'm, I got the mic now. Everybody got a good, <laughs> hear me? All right, hi everyone. Hope you're all, all doing well. I hope you're enjoying, uh, I'm sitting in my corner office in London. It's very nice. I mean, I'm sharing it with 11 people, but uh, it's still a corner office, so it sounds pretty fancy. Um, uh, but it's great to be here at Turing and uh, thank you for coming today. And hopefully this will be uh, educational uh, as well as sort of maybe even help out with, you know, sort of just even research things that you might be uh, playing around with. And hopefully this is a nice tool for, for you to explore. Uh, so the dynamic mode decomposition, let's, let's talk about it. As already just mentioned, we do want to start it from a point of view of a historical remark. And I do want to make this, this is the paper that kind of kicked it off. Uh, this is Peter Schmidt. So Peter, was a faculty member with me at the University of Washington when I first started as a young professor. He was already there and we then uh, spent uh, quite a number of years together, probably a decade or more as faculty members at the University of Washington before he went here to, he was in France uh, for quite a number of years. And shortly after this paper, he actually was at Imperial College right, right across town here. Uh, and then in the last year, he moved to uh, Kaust. So he's, uh, he's, he's moved quite a bit. But so it was during this time in France that he was, uh, that he built out this decomposition technique. And you can see what it is, right? So, and this is actually, think about the year, 2010. Not everybody had quite gone on yet to sort of data-driven science and modeling, right? We didn't have 2014 yet hit, which was sort of your... Uh, the revolution in AI and sort of AlexNet and sort of the where that was the start of everybody starting to do neural nets and deep learning across sciences. But here's a here's a nice data driven method, and he was applying it to real data from PIB measurements. Now this paper was important. It's actually this is the 2010 paper. It was actually presented at a conference in 2008. Uh, Schmidt and Sesterhen that presented the algorithm that finally showed up in JFM uh, here in 2010. Now the 2008 conference in the audience sat 
Oh, sorry, that's a picture of the composition. In the audience sat Claren uh, Clancy Rowley, who was at Princeton. Uh, I think, and they started talking with Igor Mezic uh, and, and others here. And what they realized uh, once they saw Peter's algorithm, that this was in fact uh, a directly, it was the first numerical computation of what's called the Koopman operator. So I want to come back to that in a minute. So the two, the pairing of these two papers is really important. This one actually, interestingly enough, appeared before DMD in 2010. And so this was just the publication cycle taking a long time with GFM, but this is a 2009 paper which showed that like, oh, DMD was the first actual algorithm to produce a Koopman approximation. I'm gonna talk more about Koopman in a minute, but uh, those two papers set an important foundation for us in, in sort of the theory and they applied it to jet flows, cross jet flows, things like this, did these decompositions to show uh, both space and time decompositions. So if you want to think about it, if we think about spatial temporal systems, uh, essentially what DMD is, is a decomposition, but it, it's a separation of variables argument. And this is how we solved partial differential equations for a long time. We separate space and time and then find a way to represent time, find a way to represent space. Okay. And that's exactly what this does. And let's just walk this through and see why is it so fantastic to have this approximation? Because here's the one system we know how to solve, right? And in terms of a differential equation, and we're always guaranteed to be able to solve it, which is a linear system. So the reason I put X tilde on here, because this is going to be our approximation to the dynamics, right? So there's some underlying dynamics we're going to take, we're going to measure it. And what we're going to try to do is fit a linear dynamical system to it. So what's that A matrix? What's the best fit I can get for that A matrix that explains the data? And why this is so important is that once you have that A matrix, well, you can actually solve that equation. That's the solution right there. X tilde is equal to some coefficient B of K, which is just a weighting term, times a mode, which is typically just an eigenvalue, an eigenvector, sorry, eigenvector of this matrix A, times e to the omega k, which is the eigenvalue of the matrix A. So this is basically what it is, is you're doing an eigen decomposition of A to represent the solution. And this is what we've done for quite a, quite a long time in solving differential equations and partial differential equation for linear systems is eigen decompositions. And there you go. So that's what DMD really is. Um, and so, and hopefully here, this is important, k is small. Hopefully you can take your data and you know, find some low dimensional approximation to your high dimensional system and a representation. A couple things of interest, right? You're, you've gotten yourself back to a linear system, which you have linear superposition, which means your solutions are constructed just by simply adding these up. And so as the B of K changes, you get different solution types because you have more representation of one thing or the other. Okay, so keep the solution form in mind because that's what we're gonna actually come after with DMD. Can I, can yes. I like yeah. There's a, X is bold and has a tilde. So X is a. Is a it's a state of... space. Yeah. It's this is not space. Oh. This is the this is here typically in like a dynamical systems. You said dx dt equals ax. So this is the some uh, n-dimensional state space vector. Oh, and that, that's the bold. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a bold symbol, symbol, yeah. The tilde, something else. the tilde just means it's the approximation it. to the dynamics, right? So the, the idea here is that you're going to take some data set, which is created by nonlinear dynamics, and you're going to approximate it by this linear model. And you know it's nonlinear, uh, but you know when you're taking data, it's not clear how you're going to get all of that out. You're going to say, what's just, what's just the best fit linear model? Because the linear model I know how to handle, and here's this idea. And that's exactly what they did in those early papers. It said, hey, look, we have these modes. I'm going to talk about some of the other things that didn't happen in those first papers, which are kind of surprising. In particular, once you have the solution form, you could say, oh, I can predict the future. Right? Say, so, well... I measure my data from time zero to 10, and I want to know what happened at time T100. You put in T100 right there. Seems pretty simple, right? It took me a long time to figure out, but they never did that in the early papers. And there's a reason why. Let me get to it. Okay. 
They can be complex. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so typically, we're going to try to measure systems where what we're hoping will happen is you have the real parts maybe constrained in the left half plane. Uh, so, or or oscillatory, really, right? Persistent dynamics should be living on the imaginary axis, but we don't constrain DMD that way. However, we can. I'll talk about that in the newest implementations of software. So let me give you a, a view of this, and it's going to be a simple data set. What you're going to see here is a little movie, and the movie is two objects. There's a there's this basically oscillating Gaussian, and then there's this oscillating look square inside of this. They have different frequencies, right? So basically it's a two mode thing for me, but I give you this data and say, can you, can you pull those apart? Right? So this is like your data you collected and how would you analyze this? Well, you know, if, if you have two things here, one thing you could do is just principal component analysis, right? And principal component analysis would say, Hey, there's two, there's a rank two ob objects in there. Here's one mode. Here's the other mode. And you can see what PCA does. It doesn't associate either of those objects with time. It just simply says, I'll give you two, uh, a subspace of two modes from which you can construct that. And it's like, well, that's fine, but that's not really what I wanted, right? Because you mixed these two objects together. There's independent component analysis, which tries to separate these things that are doing differently. Uh, but, you know, this is where it does sort of kind of gets the cube, it leaves a shadow of the cube here. It doesn't do so job, such a job on that, on the Gaussian piece. And then there's DMD. DMD does something else also that ICA doesn't do. It pulls out the two structures cleanly and it actually gives you exactly their frequencies too. Okay. So that's good news. That's exactly what we're kind of going after here is. Uh, is, is kind of objects like this. So where is, where is I, it's ideally suited for? Uh, when you have spatial temporal dynamics, we have modes with oscillations, right? Which is a lot of signals have underlying frequencies with them. And this is the idea is that it pulls them out. So you get a lot of interpretability. And so what can we do with things like this? So let me walk you through some fun, fun examples of what you can do with things like this. Well, here's all kinds of things you can do it. You can apply it to financial trading strategies. You guys have seen my... Pink McLaren over there, right? Because <laughs> right. I wrote this paper and I just, okay, everybody at Turing knows the pink <laughs> McLaren that sits in front of St. Pancras, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it was gone for a oh, it was, I know. Everybody's like, what is gone? It's like something happened in the world. I don't know how that happens. Okay, anyway, that's one thing you could do. You could do short time forecasts with this, make trading decisions short or longer st stock. We show you could do that with the DMD where you just take stock data. You don't have a model, but you just basically fit this thing, make a prediction. Uh, you can also do things like video background subtraction. So here's a video of some cars driving around. You can pull out foreground objects that are moving versus background. You can apply it to uh, neuroscience data here that we were pulling out sleep spindles. These are these little objects that appear for uh, just a couple seconds at a time that have certain frequencies. And so you can actually look through these ECOG recordings during sleep and pull out these interesting structures that are what are called sleep spindles and DMD is a perfect object for doing such things. So there's all kinds of applications. It's kind of agnostic. It doesn't really care what you're working on. You know, even though the early papers were all fluids, okay? There's also a lot of uh, different versions of this. I'm not gonna go into all of these very deeply uh, and we can have follow-ups on this. Uh, but you can now start thinking about too, it's like there's a version with say, well, actually, could I do this with control? Can I do this regression procedure where actually my system has a uh, an input signal and I might know B or I might not know B, right? And then so it, you can make this work for either case. So this is called DMD with control. You can also do what's called multi-resolution -resolu DMD or window DMD. And this is the idea that over time series, you might have structures that are happening on really long time scales, things that are happening on very fast time scales, medium time scales. You can pull them all out separately versus just doing a big decomposition at once. And that makes a big difference. For instance, for instance, in this data set, this is sea surface temperature data that was over a 20 year period. 
And so if you do like a 20 year period and look at correlated structures over a 20 year period, you, you get some correlated structures. In fact, you know, the biggest structure is right there. It's just basically is a, the middle is warmer than the edges, right? And it would look really nice right now to be in the middle, right? For all of us to go somewhere where red exists, right? Nice, right? Okay, all right. But the other things you miss are things like, well, El Nino, El Nino pops up occasionally. So when you just do PCA or variance-based, covariance-based methods, you miss it because it's like, well, over 20 years, yeah, it's popped up, but it doesn't leave much of a signature. Well, what multi-res does is say, let's look what happens over a 20-year period. Now let's look over 10-year periods. Let's look over five-year periods, over one-year periods. That's the idea is that you look at these different bins of windows of time. And so when you do that and these different decomposition, it's like a wavelet decomposition, uh, but now on your data. And so for instance, when you do this, all of a sudden you look here in your window of 1997, boom, there's this huge mode that's popped on and that's only you. Right. So this decomposition, the multi-scale, it's really built for multi-scale physics as well in general. Uh, I'll make some more comments at this at the end uh, that that we can talk about, because uh, sort of part of my story is that none of this stuff really works very well. <laughs> so let me tell you, OK. It's a negative message, but I want to be super clear about it. So the early things were super a lot of amount of hyperparameter tuning to get anything to work and you know getting you fix up the data it was just a ton of work to like okay let's just do it because there was noise in the data you had to really be careful about it so part of the effort was engineering the method and hyperparameter tuning it a ton to make things work okay and that's problematic for generic methods right so i'm being very truthful about it with you up front because i think we have fix-ups now uh, in other words, you know, a lot of these papers written from the 20, I would say all the for 2021, 20, 22, uh, until we get to the new pipe DMD package, uh, are, are actually not very good with data, real data, right? They're great with synthetic data, but you get real data with noise, it's a problem. So I'm going to talk about that. So I meant this comment about this relationship to Kuhnman theory, which was this Rowley paper. So all Koopman theory is, is this idea that Bernard Koopman posited in 1931. He said, if I have, and again, this is the notation we were using earlier that James, you had asked about, you know, here's this dynamical system, X is some state space vector. So if you have a nonlinear, finite dimensional nonlinear dynamical system, there exists essentially an embedding into a set of observables. In other words, you project up into an infinite dimensional space in which there exists an infinite dimensional space where there's a Kuhn operator, which means as I move forward in time, there's a linear operator that acts on that. So that's the equivalency. Now, let's talk about practicalities. It's 1931. What does Koopman not have? He has no computer. So this is his idea, and he doesn't tell you how to get observables. He doesn't have to tell you to compute any of this. It's just like a mathematical fanciness that's there. And this theorem, in some sense, or this definition, is equivalent to Cover's theorem, uh, 1965, which is sort of the, the, the underlying theorem for what was machine learning pre-2014, 2014, specifically for support vector machines. But if you project into infinite dimensional space, all your data can be linearly separated, can be linearly classified. It's a guarantee, right? If you go to infinity, of course, you don't ever go to infinity. You, you try to go large and you cut off and this, you make mistakes. But uh, the theorem says, if you get into infinity, linearly separable, you go to infinity, you can take any dynamical system, make it linear. So this is an important theorem from the point of view of, well, we don't have to work directly with our data. We can work on observables with our data. And so that, uh, and then do DMD on that, right? So that's that's some of the ideas here. So, so, so the, the Kupan operator is time independent. Uh, it's it's just a it's a map that takes you from t to t plus t to t plus delta t. Oh, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So by the way, here's I'm going to give you two simple examples of Kupan operators in some sense, or how you might construct it, because like it seems a little bit, you don't always have to go to infinity, but here's one for instance. When you're looking at top left here, top left is a 
simple two by two dynamical system, right? It's like out of a textbook. Um, and it's nonlinear. So normally you sketch a phase plane for it. You don't necessarily write down an exact solution for it, but I could trade out for these variables, y1, y2, y3, which are just x1, x2, x1 squared. And then it's closed under that. So now I have a three by three system, which is perfectly linear. So I went from a nonlinear system. I have a new coordinate system. It's now linear, this new coordinate system, right? So that's the part of the idea of a Koopman operator is like, can I, can I find that mapping? Okay. And really when I, you know, once you're here, they say, so the, or can you find an approximate mapping and then apply a DMD algorithm there? Right. So now DMD is going to even work better in this space because it's meant to find that. So yeah. Yeah, this is a special example because a lot of times what happens is it doesn't close, right? So what happens, you get this, and which means, oh, I need now, now I need a X1 cube. Oh, but now that X1 cube tells me I have to have X1 fourth. Oh, the X1 fourth says I have X1 fifth, and it just goes on forever. And then you're like, you got to close it at some point. So there's most of the time, there's a set of uh, circumstances in which is this exact. You can do this, but most times you can't do this for, for just generic systems. Can I just remind people yeah. to please speak up when you ask questions? Oh, yeah. The question was, well, I you got my answer. So hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah just going forward. I'll, then. I'll, yeah, yeah. perfect, perfect. All right, here's another example, by the way, of another system, again, where you can make a transformation to make it linear. This is if you're into PDEs or you know partial differential equations. I don't know what everybody's background is, but here's a PDE. Uh, this is Berger's equation. It's nonlinear. In 1950, Cole and Hoff discovered this transformation called the Cole-Hoff transform. It turned it into a linear system. It's exactly what we're looking for. In other words, part of these are all paradigms of Koopman. They're all suggesting there exists a transformation allowing me to have a linear representation of the dynamics. So, you know, because one of the criticisms you can make, right, is like, well, you know, constraining to a linear dynamics is pretty harsh. And it is. Uh, on the other hand, there are suggestions that can generically do it if I can just find the right coordinate system for these systems. All right. Uh, here's kind of a sketch of what this might look like. I take measurements from a system, you know, uh, and so it creates data matrices. they will talk about these data matrix X and X prime. X is my collection of data from X1 to Xn. X prime are corresponding measurements delta T later. So X goes to X prime in delta T. So all these snapshots, how do they evolve for delta T time? One possibility to build a model for this is just go directly over here and just say, whatever data I collected, those are my observables. I do DMD. I have a linear model. Okay. Another possibility is I make up observables of what I collected and then do DMD. And so I'm working not in the original measurement space, but in some lifted space. Um, and so if you have good knowledge of your system, this is where expert knowledge can be amazing because this is sometimes, you know your problem well, really well, and you can think, oh, I've got the right variable and lift that I wanna do and boom, now you get a much better linear approximation in your new variable set. So you don't have to just constrain yourself to what you measure. You can make functions of what you measure and then do DMT on that. That's, that's the whole point of this slide here. Okay, so let me give you one example of this just to show you how this works. Um, and again, I don't know everybody's background. I come from a lot of PD, you know, and your PD background. So that's why I'm giving these examples. Uh, apologies if it's not your cup of tea. That's a perfect London phrase, right? <laughs> but, but here we go. Uh, this is what's called a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. It's a nonlinear PD. And for instance, here's one of their solutions. It's the solution is called the two soliton solution. This is fully nonlinear dynamics, right? And so you can say, okay, well, what happens if I try to do DMD with it? Well, actually, here it is. I just take my measurement. X now is my state space, which is U, which is discretized. Uh, and it's actually not bad, right? It kind of gives me some of the right stuff. I'll show you the error in a moment here. But I could also say, well, I don't have to just do DMT on X. I could do like, for instance, on 
x. And look what I did here, mod x, x. You know, the absolute value squared x, x. Why did I do it? Because that's the form of the nonlinearity. It looks pretty good. In fact, I'm going to show you that this error here is an almost numerical precision to that comparison, right? So this lift up into a very simple enrichment of the variable space gives me almost a perfect model for the full nonlinear dynamics. But if I lift to the wrong variables, this is what I get. So lifting to variables is a tricky, it's a tricky business. Okay, that's what Gandalf said when Frodo went out the door, right? Is that right? It's a tricky business. Okay, anyway. So let me show you this. Here's the errors in the modes. Here's your DMD modes. What the eigenvalues are supposed to do is line up along the imaginary axis, which if you just do regular DMD, they don't. You do this lift and dang, it just nails it. This is like a theory. I, I actually know how to do this for this specific model exactly right, to linearize exactly right. And this is where they should be. And if you do it wrong, terrible things. And here's the error. And the main thing is that for this one here, where I got the lift right, the error is all the way down to 10 minus four minus five, which was my numerical stepper error. So I'm on the, I mean, I'm getting this linearly down to where the data, uh, I had the accuracy of the data. So these are kind of examples that show, okay, uh, a clever use of DMD is not to do DMD directly on your data, but to think about, is there a better set of observables that I can create out of the data than do DMD on that? Okay. All right, so that's kind of like the front end. We're gonna build linear models. We're gonna approximate them. They're nice because now I have linear superposition, uh, very interpretable. So let's talk about algorithms. And so here's here's one of the algorithms that was from 2014. It's called Exact DMD, and this has sort of been the workhorse out of things. I I collect my data. So here's snapshot. This is fluid flow flow behind the cylinder. Uh, and this is one of the canonical models to consider. So I take these snapshots. I organize the data into two snapshot matrices, matrices x1 to x1 minus 1, x2 to x of m. So really what I want is what's the linear operator that takes me from x to x prime, right? That's what I'm looking for. Because if I can find it, that means that A matrix advances the solution 1 delta t. And it does, and of course you train across all these snapshots. So it's uh, you're trying to figure out which A is the best to do all these snapshots. Okay, and the idea then is you get these set of modes. Uh, what comes out of it, in fact, is the first thing you do with this regression is look for a low rank structure. And in fact, what you find is here are these three dominant modes, and here are their dynamics. Remember, it's the separation of variable argument. So it's giving you modes and time dynamics. And so what it finds for you is three modes with three time dynamics, you have a model, a linear model. Is the first mode the mean? The yeah, basically it pull out the mean, the DC component. So you right? don't normally subtract the mean? You mm -hmm. can if you want, yeah. So that's, you know, that's an interesting thing. Like, so PCA, the difference between like SVD and PCA, for instance, is like doing some pre-processing tricks, like every, every set of the strings of the data is mean zero unit variance. Uh, sometimes that makes sense in a problem. Here, it's a fluid flow, so you just we just don't do that. I mean, you could subtract the whole meaning from it, but here you just boom, pop that out, and this is your modes. And this is how they're oscillating, and this is what it produces for you, okay? So what it is really, right, is this kind of beautiful marriage between PCA, the Fourier transform. Yeah. Um, the, the first mode, it's the same... That's actually, that by itself is a solution to the equations of motion. Here? Yeah. No, this one here? That's, uh, it's, it's only part of it, right? So essentially, you have to add all three of these up to get, so this is only a portion of the variance of this, what you're seeing in the movie, right? And then these are the other portions that make up, let's say, 99% 99 of the variance of the movie is three, these three modes added together, right? So if you if you leave off modes, you only get you you kind of lose a lot of like well I can only I can only explain thirty percent of that of that dynamics let's say something like that yeah does it fit for the number of modes as well uh, does it fit so normally what you have to do is you have to pre pick the modes right so this is a hyperparameter tuning you pick the number of modes and then you 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 do that out 
Yes, question from the audience, Mohammed. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I've tried DMVs before, actually, on traffic data, where you have a time series on a network. Uh, so I think it didn't work that well at that time. Maybe it's a different method here. But I think that what we realize is that there are certain constraints that are required in the data that to make this work. And I think a lot of the constraints would have had to do with stationarity or type of cyclicality. And I think if you if you want to, do you have any idea of where are the limits of uh, oh, yeah. uh, of yes. stage? This fact, yeah. I'm about to shoot DMD in the foot, head, whatever. whatever. Head sounds a little too violent, but I'm American, right? We have guns everywhere. <laughs> we're, we're about to stab DMD. That's more like UK style, right? <laughs> All right. So, Mohammed, just hang on one second in your seatbelts and we're going to stab it. <laughs> so, we wrote this whole book on this. Okay, what's the number one question I got on DMD? Hey, hey, I read your book, downloaded DMD, exact DMD, because we provide all this code and data. And it's like, it didn't work. In fact, one of the number one co comments I've gotten is exactly like, here's Mohammed, which is, I tried DMD on some data and it didn't work. And of course it didn't work because exact DMD sucks. So that's chapter one of this book. So whatever these authors are peddling you, do not <laughs> buy it. Okay. Uh, so actually this is a great opportunity because I'm going to undercut myself here a bit because, uh, it, it we need to up, update that chapter one of the book because it's almost, it's, it's embarrassing at this point. At the point that we had 2014, when we wrote the algorithm, we didn't know what else, right? That was the best algorithm we could do. But what came out in 2015, 16, 17 was evidence that as soon as you put any noise on the data, it fails. You bias the eigenvalues, you have some real problems. And so let me show you some of this. And by the way, here's the whole algorithm. It's really simple. Um, first, you look for a low rank structure. Then essentially you do a similarity transform down into that low dimensional subspace. And then you do an eigen decomposition and project yourself back out. It's actually pretty simple code to write. Okay. But, you know, again, here's the canonical example. And we go, hey, what could go wrong? It all works, right? And then Muhammad already said, hey, I tried it, didn't work. And, <laughs> and I think anybody's tried it probably pre. So here's, here's my hope actually from this event is first of all, I told you straight up, don't use exact DMD. I was an author on that paper, by the way. So if I am saying don't use it, you can probably trust, like, you know, most authors are going to oversell their stuff, right? I mean, that's kind of our job, right? So if I'm telling you, don't do it, you know, I'm serious about it. Okay. Uh, and so let's talk about what the alternatives are, because this was the picture that finally made me realize, oh my gosh, we have real problems with this algorithm. So what you're looking at here is I thought, okay, let's, I, I had this project I was doing with a, a guy at NASA on atmospheric chemistry data. So we basically took some lat long elevation data, and this is at a certain elevation. And what you're looking at is, and this is the, I guess the latitude you're at, and this is the time dynamics typically during the day for nitrous oxide. And that's, uh, okay. And so, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's nice. It's oscillatory dynamics. It's kind of complicated, but it's like real data, right? This is, this is what you got to deal with. Say, oh, DMD should be great on this because what does it do? Look for spatial structures, time dynamics. And you can clearly see a time, you know, periodic structure. Maybe you're not going to get it perfect, but whatever. You should at least get it somewhat. What you're looking at next in the middle panel is exact DMD. Total failure. And by the way, we're not even extrapolating. We're just trying to reconstruct the data sample. <laughs> and like you get a day out and your model's awful. It's like, wait a minute, I can't even fit the 30 whatever days that I actually gave you the data for? No. Fails. I have a quick question. Before you mentioned that you take the entire, all the slices in your timeline and you evaluate it to into the yeah. parts. But I mean, would it be an option like to uh, update the, the coupon operator like a uh, smaller time step? Yeah. So that like you don't. You yeah. You, the... Here you'd have to update it every single day. Okay. And you could only do one day, maybe forecast. But even one day is not very good, unfortunately. And, and partly, it's actually a deeper issue with DMD, which is the exact, many of the DMD variants, right? No matter what anybody tells you, I'm going to tell you this. Once you have noise on that data, including the Pi DMD package's original version, it was meant for noise-free computations. 
right? And who does noise free? Nobody, only mathematicians who can afford to live in a castle and imagine data and their data is perfect, like unicorns, no, right? Okay. By the way, I live in a math department too. So, but like, I also have some engineering focus. And so along comes Travis and this is 2018 and Travis developed a called optimized DMD. Now we're going to take a big step forward in performance because instead of doing this regression onto a linear operator, in fact, there's a theoretical foundations of why you get biasing of the eigenvalues. It pulls the eigenvalues way into the left half plane where now they pick up an imaginary, a real part that's negative and big. And so everything just goes to zero, okay? Instead, you just regress and you set up variable projection optimization procedure to directly find modes, their loadings of the modes, the modes themselves, and, and the eigenvalues. So you're doing a direct fit and you get to pick how many modes you want. And so this variable re projection routine just says, do an exponential fit to the data, right? So uh, you know that solution is linear, so it's an exponential fit. This is what you do. That was 2018. One other big advancement that came 2021 is DIA. You do one other trick, and it, I can't believe it took me this long to learn this, right? So I'm like a professional mathematician, supposedly. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, we should do statistical bagging, right? Like even an undergrad would tell you to maybe do that. And of course, I needed to probably talk to more undergrads in statistics because as a middle-aged guy who finally figured out, oh, I should do bagging. Okay, so what is the bagging procedure? Well, the bagging procedure is to take that optimized algorithm, but now instead of taking all your data, you take subsets of the data, you, right? You build an optimized DMD model. And what ends up happening now is for each bag you do, you get a mode of frequency and loadings, and then you just collect them all. Maybe do a thousand trials with different random poles. And now instead of just getting, an, you know, you say your DMD mode is the average. You, know, you could say my, you could take the mean of this as your DMD model, but it also gives you the variance. So now what you're imbued with is uncertainty metrics. So you want to go do a forecast. You're like, oh, wait a minute. When I forecast this, I have these eigenvalues, but here's the distribution of the eigenvalues. So now you can do Monte Carlo from that distribution you learned. Right, so now you can much better get an estimate of what the spread of the forecast is gonna be or even have confidence or unconfidence. Is that a word, unconfidence, You're right? Uh, uh, about your model, right away. And by the way, I keep putting this down here. This new Pi DMD package, pip install, has both is in there, optimized and bagging optimized, okay? All right, along with the ability to constrain eigenvalues to the left half plane, if you want, along with the ability to constrain eigenvalues to complex conjugate pairs, along with the ability to say, I want all the eigenvalues on the imaginary axis, all constraints in the optimization procedure. How much user input is required for this? Or is it pretty much decided by the algorithm itself? Yeah, so the question is how much user input is required for this? Basically, you get to pick, I'm gonna show you, I'm going to walk through an example with optimized DMD, BOP DMD. So you get to pick how many bags, you get to pick what the rank is you want out. So you get to pick some things, uh, but it's uh, for the most part goes in and you're there. All right. Uh, I think Gargi has a question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, you said that exact DMD will not work. Um, and one constraint of that is because there's noise on the data. So I'm just asking as a possibility, like, is it not okay? Like, can you, do you think like pre-processing the data will like make it better or like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, you could certainly pre-process and try to do some things to make it better. I, and but I, by the way, I've written lots of paper with exact DMD, <laughs> but basically I had to do exactly what you're saying, you know, do a lot of work and then you get this result and they're like, okay, I'll, Right, I tuned it up to, to for it to work. So, thank you. Yeah. If you do have multiple data for some reason, would it be preferable to use exact DMD? I so yeah, that's a good question. I would say in all cases, and just my this is my own personal opinion. All cases just use optimized DMD. 
I'm gonna show you. It's, there is, it's, it's, it's as easy as any, right? Because once we get to the pie package, you're just like, okay, can you can you afford three extra character strokes? Oh, you can just use OptiMD. Okay, uh, how about uh, yes? Uh, yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you, Nathan. What is phi n in your regression? That is uh, the most difficult part for me to understand. When you are regressing onto this oh, uh, linear mode, what is phi n? That's the mode. That's that's the actual mode itself. When I show you the fluid dynamics, it's made out of three modes. Phi n is the mode. But you have to parameterize that. So what goes in there? Does a neural network go in there? How do you when you do the the regression in the oh, cost you function? Start off, it, it can start off with just a guess of zeros, and it, it, the variable projection built it from there. It's an iterative procedure to find just the 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 mode. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You can always put in a guess, which is helpful sometimes, right? You could say, if I want this to go faster, take the exact DMD. The exact DMD actually doesn't do so bad on the mode. It does what it does terribly on is the eigenvalues. So it's not changing the sort of basic temporal structure of the data. As you're getting new, as a people add enough density by Oh, you usually have to flatten your data, right? So you always flatten the data and vectorize it to come in. Just yeah. basically, like, oh, all these the same uh so, so time. yeah yeah times time will be columns yeah mohammed do you have a more uh, one more question yeah uh, yeah uh so have you tried this on like graph graph based data or do you have like a, some kind of time series on edges uh and there might be differently uh, I haven't, haven't, haven't tried it at all on that but we could hmm. since we're yeah, that would be interesting, yeah. so yeah yeah um because it doesn't really care if it's spatial points. It's just any collection of data, right? It, it really, like when we did financial data, it's just like, here's IBM stock next to Microsoft stock. Like it was just, that was what space was for us, right? So, Nathan, can yeah. we suggest that we answer all the questions at the end? Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, yeah, stop bothering me. <laughs> all, right. all right sorry was that rude okay all right. all right so let's come back to this picture which i showed you here's the disaster exact dmd and optimized dmd boom right fixes your problem gives you a stable model uh and this is the picture for me uh which i think we first produced this in 2020 with one of my students and Travis, that was the aha moment for me. It's like, oh, cause you know, I've been getting all kinds of questions from people. Hey, my DMD doesn't work. And I'm like, I don't know what they were doing with it. And it's like, and it's like, it's not anybody's fault. This, this, this picture explains why everybody was having trouble. They were trying to take DMD onto real data and DMD, exact DMD that we talked about in chapter one of our book and walked it through doesn't actually work on real data. I stand by that statement. Here, you can even forecast with it. This is quite amazing. You take 10 days of data. I'm gonna go forecast 20 days out, right? I mean, this is the kind of remarkable thing, I think. And again, the dynamics of this thing is highly nonlinear. Uh, and yet you're still producing a pretty amazing forecast just by like, just do a linear regression. I mean, as long as it's optimized DMD, right? Not, uh, not, not the regular one. Okay. I'll just really quick talk here and I'm gonna switch over to code. You can also think about neural nets in DMT. And the only reason I think about neural nets is because everybody wants to do neural nets. The other thing I would suggest though, is before you get yourself into a system where you have all this fancy architecture you're gonna build with deep learning, baseline and all of it with a DMD model. I've seen papers written with all kinds of fancy Fancy deep learning, this deep learning, that led to do parallel. So like, you know, DMD gets you just as good an answer in some cases. And it's a little bit embarrassing, right? Because the people obviously didn't check, like, how well does a linear model work? That should always be your baseline. The baseline is there. You say, I need to beat the linear model. I'm okay with doing sophisticated neural nets. I do a bunch, but I also sanity check it to say, like, and what's my target to beat? DMD is usually your target to be. So you can do things like learn an embedding to build a linear model in. So put an autoencoder in front of your data, push it into a linear, into a space, and then enforce DMD in that space. Okay. And this is what Bethany did for some of her work. Okay. Um, 
And we've done this for much more complicated systems. I just want to walk, this one's the most impressive here is we took something that was spatially, temporally chaotic behavior and pushed it into a linear space. And so now you have a DMD model in a latent space, which I, this one always surprises people. So anybody knows the kuramoto shivashinsky equation, it's like, you can embed that in a linear space. Yeah. Do we understand why? No, nobody has, understands it yet, except for that the computer can do it. And so we need more theory here because a lot of people don't, there's no way you could do that. Yeah, no, code's there. You can down GitHub, right? Download this. All right, let me show you some code. Let me go right here. So here's what you do. Pip install, right? <laughs> Everybody can do that, even me. I, I can even do pip install, which is remarkable. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. All right, this is the one I want here. All right, you guys seeing my, there we go. So I'm going to walk through a little uh, DMD code. So pip install pydmd, and at your fingertips is the uh, following code, and I'll walk through. So this is a little tutorial. I can send this out afterwards can, to the mailing list. Can we, is this mailing list, people? Because this one's a little different than Sonic. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's standard stuff. You bring in, you know, tell them you're going to maybe plot something, <laughs> uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to create a function. And the function is going to be, uh, right here. So here you can you can kind of see what I'm going to do here. This is the function I'm going to create. I'm going to make two functions and glue them together. Now, the reason I made two functions, they have a spatial structure, which you now know the truth of, which is the first one is a setch x plus three, which is a little bump. The other one's a setch tanch. And one of them has a frequency 2.3 t. 2.3 is right, is the frequency. And I made it just perfectly oscillatory 2.8. So I already know what I'm trying to target to get out of this thing, right? So always good just to, as a test case, I know what the answer is gonna be. So I make these functions on a grid. That's what the whole first line of this thing is. 129 time points, 65 spatial points, glue it together. And here's kind of what this thing looks like. There they are. So here's one of the functions. Here's the other. When I glue them together, I get this. And the question is, now when I do DMD on this, am I able to, first of all, extract back out the two functions that made it and the frequencies correctly, right? All right, you ready for some heavy lifting? There it is, DMD, DMD. You talked about what do you have to pick? You have to pick that rank. Okay, we'll do two. I know it is two because I only put two in. And then DMD fit, throw the data in. And then we built this thing called DMD plotter. So from DMD, bring in plot summary, and here's the plot summary. So after you get the model, you can start plotting uh, things in the data. And let me just, okay, oops. Uh, so let me show you what this thing plots. So first of all, it plots something like the singular value decomp spectrum. In other words, how many modes matter? Oh, you see two. Here's what they sit in the, when you look at the discrete time eigenvalues. And in continuous time, when you look at the real and imaginary axis, here they are. This one's here at whatever, one was at 1.8, and the other one's at 2.3. Nails it. Here's mode one, mode two. There was no mode three that we could be here. And here's their time dynamics, right? Awesome. So I got the decomposition perfect, okay? Remember, numerically accurate data. And this was exciting, right? Because this is where we worked a lot in 2014. Like, hey, look, we could do this. Let's write a book and tell everybody like this is real life. This is not real life. And I'll show you in a minute because uh, we'll we'll break it. So there's also, pi, uh, you know, optimized DMD and BOP DMD. And here, let's just go ahead and use here BOP DMD. Bring in BOP DMD, same thing. So a few character strokes extra, right? BOP DMD instead of just DMD. Oh, bagging optimized DMD. So I always, in my view, this is what you should use. Bop DMD. Pick the rank, pick number of trials. If I pick zero trials, it's equivalent to optimized DMD. But there's also an opt DMD command, which then just, you don't need a number of trials. Pick the trials and pick at least at the time for the max. Yes. Yeah. 100 bags, 1,000. Like, so the noisier your data, the more bags the better you're going to be off, right? Like it's exactly what you'd expect a statistician to do, right? It's like try to do as much as possible because, and if, especially if you're in a data limit scenario, you want to like do as many combinations of the limited data you have to create the best statistical proxy you can get. There it goes. OptimD fit. Done. Okay, we're done. We got it. 
So you know, you ask the question, should I use exact or optimize? The point is, or Bach, with the package now, it doesn't matter, right? And, it, and you might as well just use a few extra character strokes to just get you the best thing, right? And that's kind of my view. Same thing, get the same uh, results here. Out, you got a nice picture. Okay, so let's come down here and just add a little noise to it. There's some more stuff here. So I'm gonna noise this up a little. There we go. Okay, I added noise. Not even that much, really. I just added a bit of noise to it and say, now from this, can I extract back what I had, right? And what you're gonna see here is, okay, DMD. Now I'm gonna do a higher rank one because it's kind of choking a little bit on this, but uh, here we go. Two modes, it still kind of gets it, right? There's mode one, mode two. It's still kind of getting it. But here's the big deal. Look at your mode dynamics. What it did is it pushed those eigenvalues into the left half plane. So if you're going to try to do any prediction with it or reconstruction, all of it's going to zero, right? Uh, and that's the big problem with DMD, in my view, if you just use this DMD fit algorithm. So I would say, don't use it. You're more likely in any real data have more noise than I just showed you. It's only not much noise. And the more noise you have, the more it pushes it. And you saw that chemistry data just flat lines almost immediately. It's the nature of that exact DMD. Op DMD, same procedure, super easy. There you kind of go, get your two modes. Here you go. The first mode, it kind of perfect, right? It's, it's actually bang on to that axis. Right, you can actually see it right there, the red sitting right on there. The blue slightly on the right half plane. And look at, but look at all these eigenvalues it's lining up. It's, it's actually thinking there's oscillations here. It's not pushing them into the left half plane. It's sitting there and saying, I'm gonna get these things um, and, and I can get them. And you could even, uh, I'll, I'll have to update this a little bit with, with this example file that gets sent out. You can even constrain it and say, look, all I want is eigenvalues sitting in the left half plane. So what that would do is make sure that that blue guy pops back over onto the imaginary axis. Okay. So now you get two stable modes. Mm -hmm. You can also say, I want eigenvalues to come in complex quantity pairs, or I want uh, everybody to be on the imaginary axis. The on the imaginary axis one is a little tough, like for this data, not so bad because it's purely oscillatory. But in real data, you actually do have decaying pieces. And then you try to like put it onto the imaginary axis and says, you may not want, you're not letting me go to zero. Well, then <laughs> I'm going to show up in your picture, right? So that's a little bit of a harsh constraint, but we found that like just making it to the left half plane, you get it there. So these are the, the things to be thinking about. And part of the reason I wanted to show you this little example code is first of all, hopefully move people into a scenario where it's like, it's trivial to try DMD, right? Pip install pi DMD, there's three lines. I mean, look, it's really one line of code, two, two lines and a third to plot it. Okay, and you have to import it. Okay, four, do we count that as a line? We, okay, let's count it as a line. But you know what I'm saying? Like if you're doing Python, it's like you can afford six lines of code hit your data, it's the baseline. See how you did. And the interesting thing, I would, if any of you have tried DMD in the past and said, oh yeah, DMD doesn't really work because actually I've heard that so often. Uh, this algorithm is a game changer. Uh, and again, on real data, like I showed you the atmospheric chemistry data, before that, it's like, this doesn't work at all. As soon as you hit it with that, it's like, Oh my gosh, you actually get something really reasonable here. And I can forecast 20 days with 10, day, 10 days of data. In fact, I can forecast better than them running their models, which are running on supercomputers, right? So to me, I'm like, okay, I did that with six lines of code and just threw it in and got it. And they're like running overnight runs for th several days to get the same 20 days. And I got it in like a few minutes, right? This is a, uh, it's pretty impressive. And the fact is, often in these systems, linear models work amazingly well. And it always, in my view, should be the baseline. You just say like, okay, I'm going to try to make a prediction. Just put a baseline linear model on there. And you're like, there's my target. If I can't beat that, why am I doing a deep neural net? Right? So, 
All right, that's all I have to say. This little code will go out to you guys. We're still, the if you if you download PyDMD now, it's all the stuff's there, but we're working on a little bit better tutorial structure so that tutorial one, right away, the way it's set up right now is optimized DMD is tutorial 14. You're not gonna get there. You're gonna like, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And by tutorial six, like none of this works. It's like, oh, did you realize tutorial 14 actually had the stuff you needed? And right now it's not set up that way. So I'm trying to write a really great tutorial one. So like from tutorial one, you're using optimized DMD uh, versus like you don't even know it exists in the package. Okay. Questions, I so, guess. I have a thousand questions. Okay. All right. Questions on the, the chat. I go to Marcus because he asked this before the way back. He asks, um, in, I, 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 okay, I'll land you to my. Oh, here. Uh, yes. Uh, let me. Oh, how about this? Uh, is I can read it right. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, we're gonna be playing mute yeah. word. Uh, okay, Marcus asks in one of the examples doing DMD on the original variable x worked better than doing uh, DMD on x in a poorly chosen lifted variable together. Why is that? Um, if the variable is chosen poorly, can't DMD just ignore it? Yeah, so this is a good question. So this is about uh, variables, right? I said you can lift into a space, but if you pick a bad observable you're just doing a lot worse. So yes, you could you can obviously test that, but now you have to write an algorithm to test your observable spaces. So what some people do, and this is the extended DMD, they actually then will try to play around with the loadings of these observables to try to see which ones do I have to cut out. And again, it's a heavy lift to do it because now you have to have training data. It's almost like a, you know, it's a neural network trying to train it to remove the wrong ones. Um, so yes, so in other words, there are unstable directions to project into. And if you pick a bad one, that's exactly what you're going to do. Okay. All right. Sh Sharik um, next, right? Oh, uh, no. Wait. Thank you. Uh, this is really me. Oh. Can you share the lecture link? I guess. Uh, yeah. So that's something that's different. Yeah. I think the link's going to be available somewhere. <laughs> uh, there's a question from William. Yeah, since... Oh, okay. Where's William? Uh, okay. How do you preserve temporal opening? Ah, when doing bagging? Well, the night, okay. Oh, beautiful thing about OpDMD that I didn't mention. So exact DMD requires you to be on a clock. You're on a clock of your sensor, delta T between time slices. And you have to stay on that clock. Uh, okay. You have two matrices, X and X prime, but the difference has to be exactly delta T between all of them. OpDMD does not care. OpDMD says, you can randomly sample. You, you have to know the time difference between them. As long as you have a clock that says, when did you, you can randomly sample in time. As long as you know when you sampled, that's all you need to know. And OpDMD works with that information because remember it's doing exponential fitting. It's just saying, what's the exponential fits? Oh, you gave me different time windows. It doesn't matter. So it's actually, OpDMD is also really perfect for bagging, right? Because bagging is all about pulling in random snapshots at different times and then reshuffling to different random snapshots. And so the Delta T's get all messed up between them. Whereas in exact DMD, you can't really do that because you can't like, I can't remove these. Now I have, I'm not on the clock anymore. Optimized DMD doesn't care about a clock. I mean, it cares about knowing when the measurement was made, but it doesn't have to any fixed relationship between time snapshots. So there's a question from the DK. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, I was just gonna say, and why? So I the bagging of the sort of improvement makes a lot of intuitive sense. I didn't really understand from the quick run through what the optimization improvement to the op DMD. So I was wondering if you, in like plainer language, you could sort of explain what that because that seems really really important and it seems to sort of prevent all the eigenvalues drifting left. Why did how does that how does it do that? Yeah, so this is a good question. So uh, so what OpDMD does is it goes, so, okay, what normal DMD methods have done before optimized DMD is to try to construct a matrix A or a similarity transform of the matrix A, right? And then do an eigen decomposition of that to finally have your DMD model. OpDMD does not try to construct the matrix A at all. It just goes directly to what you wanted, which was, give me the modes and eigenvalues. So it's a direct fit to those. What ends up happening is when you sample in time by 
going after that matrix A that tries to advance you one delta T, it actually, when you have noise, it biases the eigenvalues. So for instance, one group tried to say, debias it by saying, how about we go forward in time? So how do I go from X of N to X of N plus one? There's a matrix A. But what if I went backwards in time? What's the matrix that goes from X of N plus one to X of N? In other words, that's that's those should be inverse matrices, right? Of course they're not, but but then you say, well, how about if I average their predictions, right? I'll take I'll take the inverse of this, which is supposed to be what the forward is, average it with this one, divide by two. That's it's called forward backward DMD to try to take away some of the bias. And the bias is all due to the fact that you're going forward in time, but your model could also go backwards in time. The OpDMD doesn't care about forward or backward in time, right? It just says exponentials across the solutions. So it's, it's sort of not biased towards looking forward in time at all. It just is, it does the whole fit across the entire time frames all at once. That That's yeah, that's, that's a hand wavy, but I, I understand. Um, we have a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so if you were to do risk of classification instead of prediction uh, in the future, uh, would we use it more like a feature transform, uh, you know, and then do classification, you know, some uh, SVM or some other learning trick? Is that how you we would go? Is it possible to do classification with the generalized way? That's a good question. Uh, is it possible to, the question is about, is it possible to do classification using sort of a forward prediction like this? Uh, I guess it depends exactly how you're going to use it as a classifier, right? You could you can imagine once you have the DMD decomposition, there's a couple of things you can do with this, right? Like you actually have then a, a model that can run forward into the future. And then you could say, well, maybe on different data sets, you could look, for instance, classify by eigenvalue distributions, for instance. Maybe that's a more interesting thing. You say, like, hey, in this case here, what we're seeing is these are the frequencies that are active over here. These are the frequencies that are active. It's kind of almost what we do in the multi-res because we're trying to look at different bins of time. It's like, oh, in this bin of time, here's the active physics. Here's their frequencies. But out here in these bins of time, different. So they're like kind of, in some sense, it's sort of acting in that way. Yeah. Has anybody worked with the video, real video data? Is there any work on that? Yeah, we did we did some real video data for just background subtraction. So for instance, the zero mode. So we did is took a video with moving things in it with a background. You say, what does e to the zero t mean? Like if there's an eigenvalue at the origin, e to the zero t, it means one, nothing's happening. Oh, that's the background. We found this on accident because we got this thing wasn't working and we realized, oh, if you just look at it the zero modes and pull them out, you got the background and the rest of it. Reconstruct without that zero mode, you have the foreground objects. Mm -hmm. And so for real video data, that's the only thing we've done so far. Okay. The only other thing I should mention, and I apologize, I was going to do more talking about this, is there's also a version of this, a physics-informed DMD. Some aspects will be in here, which is one of the areas that this suffers is suppose I have a traveling wave in my domain. You know, you see what this thing's going after is low rank structure. Like, so a lot of these things are looking for SVD-based method to get it. A traveling wave with an SVD is awful because over time it's like it was here and here and here. How does this correlate with here? Well, they don't correlation is usually like what's the overlap, right? And there's no overlap. So it looks like a high dimensional system in though it's one mode traveling. So physics informed DMD by uh, Peter Badu, who actually uh, spent some time at actually Imperial here. Um, uh, he basically built an algorithm that says, how about this? We'll, we'll think about some of the symmetries and invariances in your problem, and we will put those in first. And we'll like say, oh, if you have traveling waves, there's a circulant matrix that sort of helps take care of that, looks for those kind of structures, then does DMT. It's a really nice tool to go along with the opt. Some aspects of this are built into the PyDMD DMD package. But I was kind of wondering about the inverse of that. So if you run DMD first, and then you realize that the result isn't great, or you like in the chaotic system that yeah. you had. Can you then go back and then inform the physics or is it quite hard to do that from the results that you get? So that goes actually interesting to a question around classification. So if there's a signature, let's say in the eigenvalue spectra, I would tell you like, oh, if you see eigenvalue, it's clearly suggesting there's a traveling wave, right? From the dis, oh, let's bring it back over. It, so it's in, an inference that there is a traveling wave. It can come back in, now put that in and do it forward. 
you'd have to have some kind of something that you could go after. Like if there's a clear signatures on the results that you say, oh, eigenvalues lining up like this mean this, let me come backwards and then put that in. Yeah, you could do something like that. From, from the yeah, yeah. So there's Daniel, um, a new Daniel, Mark. Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. I was just wondering about how um, this optimized DMD algorithm can pair with other um, ways of doing DMD, for example, Hankel DMD using time delay embeddings or um, using multi-resolution DMD. Yeah, so uh, in fact, a great pairing, real quick, is is the the Hankel DMD. So one thing that you can do to enrich your data set to make things more Fourier-like, which is perfect for DMD, is to take your data and do a time delay embedding. Most everything I showed here was spatial temporal data. You maybe not don't do that as much, but for time series data, certainly doing time delay embedding to build a Hankel matrix, then use BOP DMD on that. That's probably your best way forward. So I would definitely integrate it in. But the, the delay embedding, you have to just set up the matrix yourself that way. I, I don't think we have that set up in Pi DMD. There's so many features we want to keep building into the Pi DMD package that I don't think we've gotten to that one yet, which is just automatically time delay embeds for you, then does op, BOP DMD, then brings you back the results. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. There's another question from you, Ben. Um, hello. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the talk, Nathan. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, your, your book and uh, Brenton's book has in, inspired me a lot. So basically, I'm your fan. I won't take take too much time. So uh, I have a question about the uh, optimized DS, uh, DMD. I, I saw that in your picture, it looks like a feature extraction to find the uh, important terms uh, to build this DMD. So my question is, what is the physics behind this optimization? Why this kind of operation can make the DMD uh, predict it accurately. And also uh, by doing the dynamic analysis, we usually uh, pursue the uh, multiple step ahead prediction, uh, but not only the one step ahead prediction. So I'm not quite understand why this kind of optimization can guarantee the multiple step ahead prediction. So this is my question. Yeah, so a good question. Let me just go ahead and stop share here and maybe pop up the slides real quick. Oops, let me. Let me do this here and then do a screen share. So uh, in some sense, when you when you look at DMD here, when you when you when you kind of come after it and sort of do this variable projection onto this form of solution, especially for instance, and then the constraint that this eigenvalue here is imaginary, by construction, you can look as far ahead as you want. You've got a stable model, doesn't mean it's going to be accurate. But you've essentially built, so for instance, if you do a, a time forecaster, like with a recurrent neural net or an LSTM, sometimes when you walk it far out into the future, you know, go, it can go to zero, blow up, get to a fixed point. There's these interesting issues that happen with some of these neural nets that are iterative maps. But we're not really building an iterative map. We're just, we're basically, we're basically saying the time dynamics is exponential. I can even enforce it to be imaginary which means by design, I can walk it as far into the future as I want without blowing it up. And so uh, essentially you're, it's a constrained regression onto a stable model, if that's another way to say it, if you want. And so for us in physics wise, like, right, this is perfect, right? So, I mean, Fourier modes are the, the entire basis of most signal processing. Why? Because they're awesome. And you know what, you can walk Fourier modes out to time is an infinity and they don't blow up. They don't go to zero. You don't lose your signal. It didn't go to infinity either. It's just like, and you can also walk backwards to minus infinity, same thing. And so it's like this four E modes are sort of like really some of the best <laughs> ways to represent signals that we've ever come up with, right? <laughs> These objects of sines and cosines. And essentially that's what we're doing here, right? Is saying, even though I've given it as an as a as an exponential, oftentimes what we're doing is really looking for the imaginary components there, uh, and that's going to give us stable models by design. Okay, thank you. And, and part of the reason they work is I, this is a philosophical statement. I don't think any uh, weight this comment very much. Maybe, but my observation is that most of the world, uh, most physics on some scale looks pretty linear. 
with some bursts of nonlinearity. Mm. And so is it surprising the linear model works? Not really. We built this entire phone from linear models, essentially, right? We had quantum mechanics and EM, all linear models. And we were able to extrapolate out to build this thing. It's a remarkable achievement, right? Uh, so these are the kind of things we we start thinking about a little bit is that linear models are exceptionally powerful uh, and that most of the world I think is linear. And that's why this method works in many cases, not all, but you know, it does a pretty nice job, except for like, if you're data too, if you go far into the future, if you're non-stationary statistics, that's a hard handle, no matter what you do. There's, as far as I know, like if you read the statistical literature, there's step one, assume stationarity, right? And then you stay there through grad school and forever. And I was like, well, I have real data. Assume stationarity, right? I mean, this is this is a this is an underpinning of problems for all of us, right? And no matter what method you use, whether you're going to do a deep neural net, statistical ensembling, Bayesian, whatever, DMD. Uh, uh, so it's something we have to think about a little bit too, in all these. Uh, we just have one more question for you don't mind. Oh. Oh, you want to have a because okay, Thanks. Uh, so in this, uh, the uh, assumption on the signal input signal would be it has to be oscillatory, right? So you would have to cover. Would you have to always necessarily cover a large enough time to capture all the different uh, you know, oscillation oscillatory modes that you want to capture? So yeah, yeah, and so in fact, yeah, so. In these ver variants that I'm showing you, certainly. In other words, if you're on the rising edge of a cosine and you see that, mm -hmm. what this will do is say, that looks like exponential growth, even though it's gonna come up here and turn around. Now there is a method by Henning Longa who does something different than DMD, but it's very DMD inspired. And what Henning does is he, he this is his method. What Henning did is said, look, I'm just going to fit it to cosines and sines with as few frequencies as possible. And what he does, he allows this thing. If I see this, I'm not allowing you to fit it to an exponent with a real part. You're, you have to fit it to a cosine. And he doesn't constrain it to periodic boundary conditions. So what he says is like, well, if I see this, it's going to either be a sine or a cosine fit to that. And it's going to give you a frequency. So I didn't see the whole thing. I saw a portion of it, but I'm still going to fit it to that. So there are methods like this one here uh, that actually get to that. And this is again, very closely related to DMD and Koopman theory with what we're doing, but trying to get at this issue. The other thing that you can't see is like, you know, if you sample a certain rate, you can't construct frequencies that are faster than that, right? So you have always this issue of the aliasing and things like that. We have another question from Carlos. Hi there. Um, so I was wondering, especially when when you were talking about the um, basically like building new observables, uh, like is it possible directly in PyDMD um, to do something like the Cindy approach? I have a dictionary of like possible, um, yeah, mm. possible uplifting terms and and use that to kind of like be able put some kind of like regular, uh, um, yeah, regulating term to to make it as sparse and, and try to find what are actually like good projections of your observables. Yeah, we don't have anything like that yet in PyDMD. You know, maybe maybe in V3 when it comes out, uh, we'll have something like that. Right now there's a higher order SVD in there. Uh, and that kind of projections just to a larger space. So like mostly quadratics, cubics, but it's like just projects to all of it doesn't do any kind of down selection. Um, so so that's one thing that's there. You know, I mean, I think the big the big thing we wanted to push through with this new version of Pi DMD is just get an actual stable algorithm in there that can handle noise, right? So these years of me getting emails or talking to people and say, hey, I tried DMD, it doesn't work. Um, I, I imagine 90% of what I heard would have been fixed immediately with optimized DMD. And it's unfortunate, right? Because they tried it, gave up, walked away. Uh, and the same thing happens with Cindy, for instance, right? So Cindy, the new version of Cindy now has ensemble Cindy. So in fact, we did bagging optimized DMD 
it works so well. I went to talk to Urban Fazel, who's now at Imperial. And then Urban at that time was a postdoc with Stephen. I said, look, this works so well on DMD. How about we try it on Cindy? And that led to directly to Ensemble Cindy. And then there was weak form on weak form Cindy. So weak ensemble Cindy all of a sudden can get into a game where people would say it doesn't work. But now it's and it's all about noise. Anytime you go to real data, I always think that the entry point is if you can't handle 25 or 30 percent noise, there's no way you can get in the game. If you can get in 25 or 30 percent noise, you can handle that level of noise. You have a shot. There's a lot of problems that have a lot more noise than that. But like I I find very few real problems where <laughs> you're not going to have to deal with at least that much noise. Um, and so the ensemble Cindy and bagging optimized DMD are now in that point where I can look people straight in the face and say, you could try this. And I think you have a shot at it making it work uh, without having to like tune it for five weeks to, oh, I, if I just do it right <laughs> and I do all this cleanup of the data beforehand, maybe I get something out. Like this is like more just a stable way to get at it. So uh, I have a question. Thanks. Yeah. I can wait for uh, Eric to ask his question. Yeah. Uh, the end also, so I don't speak it too long. No, no, I, 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 I'm, until 4 p.m. when people in uh, Seattle start calling. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> you there? Thank you. Uh, I have a, a very, I'll be very, very telegraphic. So when we're looking at the cost function again, and this is where we discover our feature embedding, uh, we have this function phi n there of x. I understand that you discover it on the same mesh as your data. Yeah. Now, let's imagine that our data comes to us and it's given to us on different meshes. So what I want to do naively here, I want to put a comma after this x and I want to say theta. And then I want to optimize with respect to this theta. So then my phi, phi n could be a basis expansion or they could be neural networks. My hope would be that I could then do begging on the spatial coordinate and get a mesh independent version of this. And my bigger question is, if we think about it really deeply, we can relate this potentially to the green function view of dynamical systems. Here, we are staying within the Koopman view where we are looking at a linear uh, dependence in time, but we can do the spatial dependence with a green function. Does this yeah. make sense, what I'm asking? Yes, yes. And I think I think that's a fantastic way to go. It wouldn't probably work under variable projection, which did this, but one of the things that we're looking at is to try to use all the power in jacks and torch of optimization algorithms and how you can come back to this problem and say, hey, you know, let's do deep DMD, right? Which is just you're right. So right now, the fitting procedure is sort of more of this iterative walk down to this thing. It's not a deep neural net at all, but you can start imagining, imagining exactly what you're talking about. Like I have, we have all of us at our disposal, right? Once you do pip install jacks or pip install torch, yeah, you know, like you have the power of the world of optimization at your fingertips. And so if you can frame the right loss functions and the things you want, there's a lot more you can get out of this than I think we currently have. And so I think that would be amazing, actually. You know, I'm the guy who didn't make it to yesterday's meeting with Mohammed. I'm kind of working along these lines with the green function, what I said. Maybe maybe I can look you up some sometime if you're around. Well, I'm here. I'm here. By the way, in, in terms of green's function, I skipped one slide, but we did do one thing like this. We did a we did a deep green idea, which was, you know, this idea of embedding in a linear space and then having everything in a linear space. This is what this guy Dan Shea did. So it's shades of what you want to go after, which is, you know, Green's function fell out of, you know, whatever, popularity in the early 90s because everybody said, well, why would I constrain myself to solving a linear problem because I have this nonlinear problem? I could just simulate it, right? And so everybody just started doing nonlinear simulations and nobody used Green's functions anymore because they were only a linear for linear problems. But imagine, well, I just need to learn a transform, put it in a new coordinate yes. system. Now all the, all the Green's function stuff holds and get a fundamental solution out uh you know and but i like this idea of like a meshless version of this would be amazing too right meshless maybe even a parametrized meshless version like that a neural operator combined with a time dependence of exponents like yeah. thank you very much thank you for the fantastic talk yeah, thank you. i'm around so we might see well, hopefully i'll see you on thursdays here or something okay. <laughs>
Yeah, okay, so just one last note on, on the noise. So, you, so you, 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 you mentioned a lot of words that exactly indeed it's not work because noise is present in the data, but um, maybe you can comment on the distribution of the noise. So the example you showed, the noise was homogeneous, but in transient situations, the noise is not like that. And, yeah. and most real situations are composed of transient behavior. So I, I'm a big fan of the MDC because in the MDC, if you have known sources of the yeah. signal system, the decoupling happens really well. Yeah. And I and especially like for yeah. example in non-periodic yeah. EMD works very well in very period where there's periodicity. If you have non-periodic behavior, the MD suffers. And I wonder what the what the MD does in those situations. But the MDC works nicely because again, if you have um you have exposure, you have availability of that control signal, it works well even in non-periodic behavior. So I am wondering like Bob DMD deals with uh, transient, really transient situations. I've had good experiences with the higher order version of DMD on situations, but I wonder how Bob DMD does that. Yeah, so the question is around how well does Bob DMD do on, on transient behaviors, right? So that's the, the sort of, in some sense, the, the workhorse of DMDC, which actually accounts for actuation in the system and this ability to handle this. So uh, Bob DMD currently doesn't really handle that very well, but this is actually an active area of research we're doing right now is to try to figure out, can we do not DMDC, but BOP DMDC? In other words, all these massive improvements that we got from going from exact DMD to BOP DMD, currently DMDC is only formulated in terms of exact DMD. It has this huge advantage of being able to handle you know, things that are forcings in the system. But what we really want to do is bring that over to BOP DMD. And then if we could have a BOP DMDC, then you imagine now I get this much more accurate model that handles this there. Uh, but it's a hard problem to get stored in. So we're trying to like figure out how to do that. Well. And hopefully if we can get it into V3 of Pi, Pi, Pi DMD. <laughs> the, the wish list goes, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger for DMD three. We have more questions. Yeah. Uh, so um, in this, there is a natural ordering. So it's a time series data yeah, that yeah. we've been focusing on. Is it possible to work on data which does not necessarily have, for example, a mesh? Uh, so in an image, if you don't, it's just an image, not a video. So there's no natural ordering of uh, the points of the sample points. So is there? A wave that you see? We haven't done that. I mean, you could, I mean, if you had an ordering of points and you wanted to do a spatial DMD model, you could walk it from left to right so that you get spatial frequencies, but you'd still have it ordered by columns. Like, okay, I, you know, my picture, here's the ones on the left, and I'll march it through to the right. So I get X frequencies. I could march it up and down to get the Y frequencies. So you could do something like that. Um, but we haven't we haven't played much with that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here. Um uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Nathan for, for the great book. And thanks everyone for joining online. And also thanks for those who are here in person as well. This was really cool. This was one of our first hybrid ones. And also thanks to Rich for for the support and thanks to Levon because I forgot to thank you and mention it before. Uh all right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good seeing everybody. Hope you all have a nice rest of your, of your day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Zach, where, uh, where is the recording being saved? The recording will be on my laptop. I'll share it with you. All right. Wonderful. Yeah. there We have a space for Tech Talks uh, on SharePoint, and I can upload it there and then make it available to whoever wants. So. We'll do it. Okay. All right. Um, thank you once again. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind, I think 